hello and welcome to another of our winter warmer talks and we'll be delivering this series of talks throughout the winter months seeing us right through into spring. So my name's Laura and I'm the community learning officer at the Royal Parks and we are the charity that looks after London's eight Royal Parks which are Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, St James's Park, the Green Park, Regent's Park and Primrose Hill, Bushy Park, Greenwich Park and Richmond Park and we also look after Brompton Cemetery and Victoria Tower Gardens and tonight I'm very excited to introduce Rachel Douse, one of our fabulous volunteer officers at the Royal Parks. So by day she leads a double life. By day, Rachel works with teams of volunteers and all sorts of on all sorts of conservation projects designed to enhance the biodiversity of the parks. But in a different life, she won an award for the presentation on starlings she is about to deliver to you, which was based on her master's dissertation. So as I've said, please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions and we'll answer them at the end. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand over to her. So settle in and enjoy. Thanks, Rachel. OK, hi, everybody. Thanks for that intro, Laura. Um, so I should start by saying I'm not a uh, biologist necessarily. So my master's was actually a literature master's and uh, the dissertation was about starlings, but based in a way that people can understand that isn't in a sort of very scary, complicated biological kind of way and not just about starlings as a bird, but also kind of why they're important and all of the different things that they can represent to us. Um, so that's kind of what this talk is about. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so hopefully you might not know what a starling is. Actually, it's quite common. I found when writing a dissertation about them that uh, lots of people aren't actually super clear on what a starling is or if they wouldn't recognize one if they saw one so if that's you that's totally fine uh the picture up on screen that hopefully you can all see uh is a starling this sternus vulgaris that is the european starling um and so we can start by just what you can learn just by looking at this bird if you saw this bird sat on your picnic table which they quite often come along to do um while i was writing this dissertation i had them flying in through my kitchen window and hopping around on the table there because they'd figured out student accommodation was quite a good way to come and get some crumbs um but if we're looking at this bird on screen uh what can we learn just by looking at him so if you look at him you should be able to see that he's got these little almost got these little kind of white dots on his feathers um, and actually you can see it a bit clearer in the next slide. So if you can see, you can see his white dots much more clearly. Um, so the fact that this starling's white dots aren't very clear and they're not really there means that it must be the start of the breeding season because um, starlings in winter have these very nice white dots, which are little white uh, feather tips to their wings. But in the breeding season, they like to fly in and out of holes looking for places to nest because starlings are hole nesters. They nest in old woodpecker holes or natu natural cavities in trees or little holes that are made in man-made structures as well. And as they go in and out of those holes, um, they their feathers rub against the sides of the hole and it rubs the... Um, white tips off of the tips of their feathers which is why in summer and in um spring and summer in breeding season starlings are much shinier and sleeker like this and then in winter after they've molted and they get their white tips back they're sort of all speckly like a lovely starry sky like this one um so the fact that this bird uh say we saw this bird in early spring and he'd already lost lots of his white feather tips that could be a good clue that he's a male because the males scope out the holes first the males go and check out loads of different places where uh, a good nest site might be um, and so they lose their white tips of their feathers first and then later on in the breeding season the females they'll start off a little nest and if the female likes it lots of bird species do this they start off what's called a proto nest and the, fe the female will go between the different proto nests that the male has uh, set up for her and if she'll pick the one that she likes and then they will together finish off building the nest um, and they're actually pretty clever about it. They like to include um, fresh greenery, which helps keep away parasites. Um, they particularly like the tips of tomato plants. They'll come and snip off the tips of your tomato plants and um, they'll lie them. Uh, they'll include those in the nests because they help to um, uh, what's the word? deter parasites like mites and things that birds can get in their plumage. Um, and but they also use uh, lavender, daisies and daffodils. So a starling nest can really be quite pretty. Um, and but there is another clue that we could get from this bird which to figure out if it was a male or female 
So if you look at his beak, you see his beak is very, very bright yellow, which is because it's the breeding season. If you look at this other bird, see he's got this very dark beak. Um, in the winter, all starling beaks are that dark brown colour, which means it's much harder to tell if it's a boy or a girl. Uh, but in this breeding season, you see the very base of this bird's beak is blue. Uh, and starling beaks, the base of a starling beak in breeding season is blue for boys and pink for girls, which is pretty astonishing, really, um, that they've lined up with our cultural preconceptions. But there we go. Um, so you can see the blue at the base of that starling's beak means that he's a male as well. So all of that is just what you can learn just by looking at a little bird that's hopping on your bird table. Um, but find my notes again. Um, that's, so that's kind of some basic ideas about starlings and what you can learn just by looking at them. They're also considered quite kind of oily birds, I think, that gets thrown around quite a lot, which I guess you can kind of see through the colours on their feathers. They are quite kind of oil slick colours. But interestingly, you can also tell um, where the bird is from by looking at the colours on his feathers. And actually, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, because the uh, basically the tips, basically, well, it's to do with the cap. So the, the three places on the bird that you want to look to see uh, which that you need to look at to tell where he came from is his neck, the top of his head, uh, his back, which is called the mantle and his chest. And in the most starlings, the sort of Sternus vulgaris with no subspecies whatsoever, um, it will be purple. He'll have a purple neck. He can have a purple or a green head and all of the rest of him is going to be green. But there are other species that uh, where those which bits of him are green and which bits of it are purple will swap around. So there's it's not a different species. It's a different subspecies. But there's a subspecies from the Faroe Islands where um, the blue and the purple and the green all swap round. Um, and I think they have a green neck and a purple back. Um, and that's it's still Sternus vulgaris, but it's just the ones that come from the Faroe Islands, for example. Um, so that's all of that information you can learn just by looking at a little bird hopping around next to you. Um, but the thing with Sternus vulgaris, while it has got these really quite nice, shiny, oily colours on him, they are actually one of the more boring members of the starling family. So these three birds, there's lots of different starling species across the world. These are all starlings. These are all from the Sternus um uh family this is a african cape starling uh which is the um doo -doo -doo, i think that's the one on the left the one on the right is the um hildebrandt starling and the one at the bottom is the superb starling um so these are all from africa um so you, oh i didn't mean to change slide there but so you can see how um diverse starling species can be and actually starlings are also very closely related to the lyre bird which I will which will be relevant later on um, but Sternus vulgaris which is the starling that I'm talking about uh, definitely wins across all the starling species for numbers so here is a map of all the different places where you can find um, the common European starling so we've got I don't know if you can read the key there, but um, the strip of dark green through the middle are starlings that just stay in the same place all year round. They don't migrate. Uh, but the yellow birds up the top, um, they migrate south in the winter because they're from places that are very, very cold and they don't like it. And the blue strip along the bottom migrate north in the summer because um, they're from places where it's very, very hot and they don't like it. Uh, which does mean, and so we don't get any southern migrants in the UK, but we do get northern migrants coming down in the UK. So in the winter, um, we get a massive influx of starlings from Scandinavia and Russia, um, which is why you quite often see more of them in the winter than in the summer. And that's why their big murmurations, which I'll come on to later, um, have so many more birds in in the winter because uh, we've got those extra migrants coming down. Um, but you can see how um, successful they've been in colonising Europe, and which is partly why we have such a long history with them um, as human beings. Um, the ones in America were introduced, and I'll get onto that in a little bit as well, because that's a story in itself. Um, but the 
well, some of the reasons why they've been quite so effective is because they're very, very efficient at foraging. Um, they'll eat, they're omnivorous, so they'll eat insects and fruit and seeds, anything they can find. And they have this um, adaptation in their beak where when their beak, they can kind of jerk their beak open almost on a spring, uh, which so they stick their beak in the ground with it closed and pop it open to kind of dig into the ground to find grubs and worms and things, which works very well for digging into sort of frozen ground or hard muddy ground, but also very good for ripping into bin bags and things like that. So they live they live very well in cities and they do quite well around humans. And interestingly, as their beak pops open, as uh, the muscles in their head force their eyes forwards so that they can see what they're looking at and then when they close their beak their eyes go to the side again i don't think it's it's not dramatic enough that you can see it happening but um the muscles just push their eyes forwards which is a really interesting adaptation that not many other birds have um but because they're so common and they because they've been around for so long they're kind of peppered throughout history really um, but at the same time because they're so common they're kind of almost hidden they're not they're never the big showy standout topic of a novel or a book um, and they don't not even necessarily use that much as any kind of symbolism they're not like the white dove for peace or a owl for wisdom they're just kind of there um, which I think is really interesting which means you have to dig around a little bit to find um, other starling obsessives uh, but they are around so uh, let me just get my powerpoint again where have all my slides gone there we go. So Aristotle, this is him on the slide, um, used starlings as his kind of basic unit of measurement of birds. So he described all other birds as how big they were in relation to a starling. So were they as twice as big as a starling or half the size of a starling, uh, which means he was obviously seeing them as like your basic bird <laughs> sort of. Um, and actually their name almost backs this up. So starling comes from um, the words, the Proto-Indo-Germanic word stare, which means star and ling meaning small. Or no, stare doesn't mean star, sorry. So it's just this word stare. And if you go back to see what this word stare means in Proto-Indo-European, um, it literally just means small bird. That is as far back as linguistically we can go. So our word for the very first word for small bird that we had when we were first developing language is the word that we now use more or less for starlings. That's how much of the just ubiquitous basic bird is, uh, that they are in um, European culture, which I find really fascinating. Um, Stonehenge. Um, he's slightly less well known than Aristotle, but the pioneer archaeologist from the 17th century, John Aubrey, who was kind of one of the first people kind of digging into um, archaeology in the UK and coming up with theories of what all these stone monuments and things were. Um, he decided that starlings must have been sacred to druids because he saw them nesting in the holes in Stonehenge. And he decided the druids must have um, made those holes on purpose for starlings to nest in. Um, unfortunately, there is a problem with that theory, which is that Druidism didn't develop in the UK until quite a long time after Stonehenge was built. Um, so probably that connection wasn't true, but there are still starlings that nest in Stonehenge, whereas um, Druids generally have to stay behind the fences when they visit it. So um, I guess they sort of won in the end. Uh, Mozart as well, if you don't recognise him, I'm not sure I would have if I hadn't looked up the photo. Uh, also loved starlings um, and very interestingly on the 27th of May 1784 in his expenses book he wrote uh, that he had paid 34 kreutzer to purchase a starling bird uh, and he also noted, jotted down in the expense book a little bar of music and the phrase das war schön which is that was beautiful. Um, and here it is, or a transcription of what he'd written. So the one on the top is what uh, Mozart had written. And the one on the bottom are, is the actual notation for his concerto number 17 in G major. Um, so what he'd written was this concerto, was a little bar from this concerto, but a few of the notes are wrong. And so we're pretty sure that what he's written is what he'd heard the starling whistling and that's why he's bought the bird uh, because he heard it whistling one of his own concertos and this particular concerto he'd only finished it on the 12th of april and but so by the 27th of may by the when he buys this bird it had only been performed publicly once 
So we think he probably, the bird must have learnt this song from Mozart himself. Um, and we don't know if this was on purpose because he obviously didn't own the bird yet, whether he was going and visiting this bird in a pet shop every day and whistling to it, or whether he just happened to have whistled the song near the bird and the bird had picked it up. But um, it obviously left an impression on him because he's bought the bird. And um, three years later, when the bird died, he had a funeral, a full funeral with veiled mourners, hymns, and he wrote a poem, him personally composed poem in rhyming couplets about how lovely this bird was and how sad he was that it had died. So Starling's very important to Mozart. And there's a bird vocalisation researcher who put forward a theory in an academic paper that Mozart's piece, A Musical Joke, which was completed uh, not long after this starling died, must have been partly inspired by the bird's song and could have actually been intended as a yet another tribute to the bird. Um, and a musical joke by Mozart was seen as a parody of fashionable music at the time. It's sort of a deliberately bad composition. It's got very odd time signatures. It's got strange emphasis on certain notes and um, a lot of mismatched musical styles kind of randomly strung together. And this is pretty much exactly how a starling creates its song. Because starlings are mimics, uh, they, as I said earlier, they're related to the minor bird. So the minor bird you may have seen on David Attenborough shows and things like that. It's that bird that does the um, really, really, really perfect mimicry in on um, wildlife documentaries. It's always imitating the sound of a camera shutter going off. Um, and starlings are related to them. And they create their songs. Uh, any wild starlings you hear in the wild are creating their song by copying snatches of songs from other birds um, and stringing them together in their own composition. Um, and they'll quite often incorporate other sounds that they hear a lot as well, like car alarms or telephones. Um, and yes, yeah, stringing them all together. Um, when my mum was young and everybody's had landlines that all sounded the same. Um, you quite often heard starlings imitating uh, telephones. And she said you were quite often running in from the garden because you thought the phone was ringing and it was just a starling copying the tele making telephone noises. Um, and they think that the more sounds that a starling has copied, uh, the more attractive it is as a mate. Um, so they, they're, they're always trying to get their songs as complicated as possible. And they are really good. Quite a lot of kind of um, bird watchers that really know their stuff have stories of being fooled of hearing a really rare bird but it's actually it's just a starling copying it um uh but they don't just mimic the sounds of other birds because starlings can be taught to talk and not many people know this and it really surprised me when i found it out um they don't just mimic bird song they don't just mimic carolans they will also mimic human speech um but they can only form that they will tend to only ever mimic human speech. This is interesting um, when they formed a relationship with a person. So they did an experiment where they took new newly hatched starlings and they raised some of them in a cage without really any human contact. And they raised some of them in a family home in a cage with lots of people going back and forth chatting to them. Um, and the ones that didn't have human contact, they played human speech on a tape recorder to them. And the ones that just had human speech off a tape recorder, none of them mimicked human speech at all. They, some of them mimicked the noise of the tape recorder turning on and off, but none of them ever picked up any human speaking. Whereas the words that were kept in a family home were saying phrases all the time. So there's obviously that connection with like a live human being that's needed for them to pick up speech. Um, but there is, I can try and play a quick YouTube video of one, my favorite video of one of them talking. Um, we'll see if this works. If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. But let's see. Um, so if I share that and allow sound, um, can people see this video? Yeah, we can see it. Oh, and if I press play? Yeah, I can hear it. OK, so.
One more little bit that I'm going to play before I stop it that he does in a second. That's just really amazing. Start three as a scratch. Yeah, so. That is Spike the Talking Starling. Let me just get the PowerPoint back. But you can see how many different sounds he picked up. And what I found really eerie about that one is that he, um, it's he's got his talking voice, but he also, he's picked up, they explained in the description, the sound of a, um, uh, the sound of a, uh, well, it's not an answering machine. It's that their telephone says call from every time it rings. So it's ring, 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 call from whatever. And he's doing that robot voice. And also that he's picking up all the noises of his, of his owner's breathing. Um, so there's lots of sighs and noises in there. Um, and that's just uh, that's just the noises that they make. They said they reckon it's the noise, all the different noises they make when they come down in the morning and make their cup of coffee. So you can hear the cupboard opening, you can hear the teaspoon tinkling on the um, on the mug, and then you can hear the owner going, ah. and there's also a bit in the middle which is putting the cat out, which was going, Suki, Suki, out, <laughs> which you could hear. So, um, so I just think that video is really fascinating. And there's something very weird about hearing this coming um, from a wild bird I think we're kind of conditioned to hear talking coming from a parrot or something like that but when it's coming from a bird that you just see out in the street all the time there's something really quite eerie about it I think um and and the fact that it comes from his throat as well not really even his beak so he's making all these breathing noises but he's not even opening his beak and it's also really quite hard to convince yourself that he doesn't know what he's saying and that these are just noises to him and he isn't making up sentences um but every noise that he made there is mimicked the bird noises he was making when he was actually chattering they say in the description as well they also have a rescue sparrow that's kept in the same house and that's him just copying the noise of the sparrow um there's a few little like clicks and whistles that they'll do that aren't mim mimicked but almost every kind of birdie noise that you hear a star starling make is will be mimicked from another bird um so this might be why Pliny the Elder described him as speaking Latin and Greek, and he claims that he knew starlings that spoke Latin and Greek and practiced diligently and spoke new phrases every day in still longer sentences, is the quote. So so the ancient ancient Greeks knew um, new starlings could speak and we've all just forgotten, I think. And somebody else who knew all about talking starlings is this one. Um, hopefully people can recognize Shakespeare there. Um, he refers to speak talking starlings as well. Um, it, just the ones that in this play, the history of Henry the fourth, um, and this is the scene. Um, uh, so I won't read the whole thing out, <laughs> but you'll see the bit where he says, um, I'll have a starling. She'll be taught to speak nothing but Mortimer and give it to him to keep his anger still in motion. So he's going to teach starling to say Mortimer and Mortimer and Mortimer to wind this guy up basically. Um, so obviously it was just and that to a um, Shakespearean audience that wouldn't have been like, oh, what? Starlings can talk. We, we just knew that that was a thing that they did, probably because they were kept as pets a bit more um, back in the day than they are now. Um, and actually, the reason that we have talking starlings now is pretty much all of the videos of talking starlings that you'll find if you look on YouTube are from America. And in America, starlings are classed as pests. They're a pest species, which means they don't have any protection whatsoever. In the UK, if you found a fledgling starling, um, it would be illegal to just take it home. You would have to take it to a rescue centre. Um, 
but uh, or you if you took it home, you'd have to have a license. Basically, you would have to have a license to keep it as, to rescue it as a pet. And a lot most of the talking starlings, they'll have an explanation to say, you know, I found this bird as a fledgling. It wasn't we tried. But I think Spike, they said they tried putting him back in the nest twice and both times his mum kicked him back out again. And it was before he had his feathers on or anything. So um, so they hand raised him at home. Um, but the reason that you can just hand raise him without going and getting a license or anything in America is because they're a pest species. So they have absolutely no federal protection whatsoever. Um, there's only three species of bird that that's true of in America, which is the house sparrow, starlings and um, the feral pigeon. Um, because they're actually considered an invasive species in America um, because we introduced them and how we introduced them goes back to Shakespeare again. So in 1880, there was a bloke called Eugene Schieflin, and he was a member of the American Acclimatization Society. And they who were trying to basically trying to make America more like Europe so that everybody would feel more at home there. Um, and he decided one way he was going to do this was to introduce every bird mentioned in Shakespeare to America um, because and there's a whole in the full dissertation version of this, I have paragraphs on all of the implications of that and what that mean, meant about society at the time and how just hearing birds from Shakespeare was going to cultivate the masses. But um, almost every bird that he tried to introduce, including all the birds that uh, mentioned far more often in Shakespeare, all those birds that have far more kind of cultural significance almost, um, did not survive. But the starlings did. He released 100 into Central Park over two years and they now cover as you saw in that map back at the beginning the entirety of north america and have started their own migration pattern up and down the continent as well um and they're considered a pest because they eat a lot of fruit crop um if a massive flock of starlings comes to um your cherry orchard for example you're going to lose all of your cherries um and they they really try and get rid of them um there is a poison used by um, uh, the, what's it called, the FDA, uh, literally called starlicide, that's specifically to try and poison starlings, um, but nothing's working. They're just doing very, very happily in America. Um, in 2007, um, somebody called, an artist called Brian Collier um, decided as an art project, to, he set up tape recorders next to starling nests that just said the word Sheeflin over and over and over because he was trying to teach them to announce the name of the person who brought them to America. But as he he should have looked up that study that uh, we were talking about earlier because then they didn't work because they don't learn speech from tape recorders. Um, but it's quite interesting this and I think there's a conflict there. So because of the way that starlings a huge mass of birds that completely fill the sky when they fly around um, has a very specific cultural significance in America because of the passenger pigeon. So if you don't know, passenger pigeons are extinct. They were one of the first sort of big extinction stories. They used to fly in flocks that would cover the star sky for days in America um, and were eventually hunted to complete extinction. And now they have a new bird with these huge flocks that maybe don't cover the sky for days, but that can flock in these huge shapes in the sky. And they're trying to get rid of them with star aside, but there's a interesting kind of cultural thing going on there that is sort of interesting to think about. But of course, when starlings flock and they cover the sky very beautifully, it's called a murmuration. So we have to, if you can't talk about starlings without talking about murmurations. Because um, on autumn and winter evenings, starlings will begin to gather in groups in the early evening and then fly from their various feeding grounds towards their roosting site. Because starlings sleep communally in large roosts, usually in trees. And it's thought that this protects them from the wind, as well as providing a space where they can establish hierarchies and um, share information on feeding sites and things like that. Um, but what remains basically unexplained is their behaviour just before roosting. Because other roosting birds, like rooks, for example, uh, will all gather at the site, at a site near the roosting spot, um, like a field or something, and then they'll all fly up together and all go into the um, roost all at the same time, usually very loudly. So they'll be cawing the whole time, um, which is a very, very spectacular sight. But starlings don't just do that um, and are far more dramatic. Um, because before coming into roost, these small, kind of uninteresting, generally quite disliked, birds form this huge great dense group and swoop around the next nest site with each bird moving almost exactly simultaneously with its neighbours 
and they form these huge, beautiful, endlessly shifting shapes in the sky. And these ordinarily quite noisy birds are completely silent while they do it, apart from the rushing sound of thousands of wings. And they perform these manoeuvres for up to half an hour before they all settle down into the roost again and then just start up their screeching chatter as if nothing's happened. And it's absolutely amazing. I'm not going to try and show you a YouTube video of it because you really need one in good quality. And I think sharing you videos through Teams, um, you don't quite get the quality of the to see each individual bird. But there's hundreds on YouTube. Just type murmuration into YouTube and you'll see it if you've not seen one live before. Um, the nearest really spectacular one to London, if that's where you're based, would be Brighton Pier. Um, that's where I've seen them. Um, and seeing them is what inspired me to write a 20,000 word dissertation on them. Um, so it's it's pretty inspiring stuff. Um, or the really famous enormous one is on the Somerset levels in the reed bed. So it's worth checking out those if you're near those areas and can go and look at them. And how they happen is that each bird is mimicking the seven birds around it. They figured this out through studying them and modeling them. Um, but what's really lovely is it's the mistakes in imitating them that makes these lovely pattern. If one bird makes a tiny little mistake copying its neighbour, then the birds copying that bird copy that mistake. And that's what makes these beautiful rippling patterns that ripple out through the flock and uh, move around like that. And they're actually technically they're in a phase transition when they're doing this, um, if you're talking kind of particle physics basically. Um, so it's similar to what molecules are doing when they're turning from a liquid into a gas. Um, that's basically what starlings are doing when they're murmurating. And it's such an amazing concept and it could be used to represent so many different things like it would just it just makes such a good metaphor from I don't know, like the internet to activist movements um, to even all the the way that all these little facts that I've just rambled on at you about starlings kind of all come together to form this kind of idea of the whole of the bird as a whole and how you understand it and once you've seen it you never really forget it um but weirdly murmurations are kind of just absent from our language and understanding um along with our general knowledge about starlings really um hardly anyone seems to know what it is i'm um, obviously i'm speaking to a audience of people who we're willing to come along and listen to somebody talking about starlings for however long. So hopefully not much longer. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so hopefully you might have heard of murmurations, but lots of people have ne no idea what it is. Um, it is not a recognised word on Microsoft's office. You get a little wriggly red line under it saying this isn't a real word. Um, if you put it into Wikipedia, it redirects you to just the page for flocking, which is not really the same thing. Um, it's just kind of not known or really thought about. Um, you know, one of my I um, did my master's in Essex, but I did my degree in Brighton and hardly any of my friends from Brighton knew what I was talking about when I talked about the murmuration, even though they're um, even though they lived in a city where the one of the most well known ones happens. So. Um, and I just feel like this lack of knowledge or kind of widespread acknowledgement of murmuration is almost significant symbolic of quite a, of a larger issue really because if you don't know about murmurations and you don't know that starlings can talk and you don't know all of our whole long history with them and if your main mental image of a starling is um is a sort of this oily bullying little common bird that just comes and kicks all the other birds off your bird feeder basically um then it becomes just Basically, if your main I've just realized my start my slides have gone in the wrong order. Basically if your main mental image of a starling is something like this, then it becomes quite a lot harder to care about this. So starling numbers are falling dramatically um, in the UK. We've talked about how they're, they're fine in America. Um, so a th only a third of fledglings survive to their full, to survive their first year. Um, they're on the RSPB red list. Um, and it's the usual story, loss of habitat, loss of food. Um, climate change, um, all the things that are affecting basically huge swathes of UK nature um, are also affecting starlings. Um, pesticides, meaning they have fewer insects to eat um, and pesticides on the fruit that they eat, then getting into their food chain and getting into their system, everything else. Um, 
And I mean, one explanation for why starlings do the murmuration, there's lots of different theories of why starlings do a murmuration, but one of them is that they're signalling other birds, here's the roost, come and find us. But we could also kind of take it as a signal that if we lose the starling, we use this, we lose this whole connection to history or culture. You can look at a starling and think, Mozart had one of those and he loved it you know you can um you know this is a bird that Shakespeare saw and knew about this is a bird that you know so many people and you know I've just talked about sort of pretty standard white European culture there's so many different cultures that we could go and look into that probably have connections to this bird um and we lose all of those connections if we lose the starling and the thing is it's not just starlings um because if you deep dive into almost any species really, especially the really common species, the pest species, the species that are sort of among humans all the time and in a way that we don't like almost. Um, these are quite often the species that are doing quite badly and nobody really notices or cares. Herring gulls, I mean, you might think a starling is my favourite bird. My favourite bird is actually the herring gull um, and herring gulls are on the red list, which um, people refuse to believe because they just see them as horrible bullies that come and nick their chips. But um, no, herring gulls are declining as well. Um, but if you really dig into a species like this, like I've just done for the starling, or like I basically spent six months doing for a starling, to be fair, um, you're basically always going to reveal this whole wealth of stories and knowledge and history. Um, and by explaining it like really at length, you know, their history, their biology, the metaphorical potential of a murmuration, um, or just their importance, really. I'm hoping that you'll go away and maybe think about them more or notice them, pay attention when they're there or miss them once they're gone. And on the other hand, if the starlings die out, humans are going to lose this whole font of kind of knowledge and understanding. And the tr same is true of any wild thing, really. I mean, I've chosen starlings, but I could have chosen herons or ash trees, porpoises, blackberries or conkers, all of which were on a list of words that were removed from the 2008 edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary, which caused a whole campaign, um, which uh and is actually ended up creating a very beautiful book called spell songs where a whole um robert mcfarlane who's a nature writer wrote a poem for every nature word that had been removed from this oxford junior dictionary and a load of artists illustrated them and then some musicians came and set them to music so um when i made that point when i wrote this i should point out i wrote this dissertation in um 2014 uh some of these things are people are thinking about and talking about and doing things with um Luckily, I, you know, I chose starlings, all these other species need help, but actually quite a lot of other people are doing this. So if you go into any bookshop and find the nature section, um, you'll quite often find all these personal book length narratives on bees, reptiles and amphibians, goshawks, badgers, hedgehogs, otters, rooks, swallows, peregrines, salmon, dragonflies, beech trees, moorlands, weeds. These are all books that you can buy <laughs> available now. Um, and they're not, they tend not to be basic field guides there or scientific studies. They weave personal narrative and cultural history into the sort of biological knowledge and historical knowledge. And they're all trying to do basically what I'm doing here um, to kind of induct other people into the wonder of their chosen species. So my kind of challenge to you, if you're here watching this talk, really, is to find a Find a species, like a common species that you see every day and don't really think about it, and just find out about it. Just notice it a bit more if you see it on your way to work. And once you're in the habit of noticing one species, you'll begin to spot more. You'll spot the food choice of your chosen animal. Um, it's lookalikes, so it's predators. And then eventually it's the environment or the whole ecosystem that you're noticing and you're understanding and that you're kind of learning to love and respect, really. Um, see if there's a book about it. If not, write one or start a blog or talk to your just talk to your friends or neighbours or co-workers about it. Just kind of spread the love, really. Um, and it's especially important to do this for the unliked and unwanted or particularly urban species. Although I know they're not very urban, but actually one of the most under-recorded mammals in the UK, the one that we have like almost no data about where they are and how they're doing, are rabbits, because nobody reports on rabbits, which means, and actually one of the reasons we didn't realise hedgehogs were in real trouble until really quite late on them being in real trouble was because nobody ever bothered recording hedgehogs. Because, oh, hedgehogs are everywhere, they're really common. So the species that we think are really common and not worth our attention now, not necessarily the true in the future. Um, because we do have a kind of particular problem as a society with urban species, you know, like um, 
foxes, pigeons, gulls, parakeets in London. Because um, if an, an animal has like adapted to our cities, it's out of necessity. Um, and it's quite hard to remember this. We we take up a lot of space. And if an animal has figured out how to live in that space that we take up, then honestly, good on it. Um, but I think they tend to make us uncomfortable because they break this kind of artificial boundary we've created between nature and us. Because um, nature is out there, kind of tucked away in reserves or out in the countryside, especially for us in London. It's something we go to visit. Even, you know, the Royal Parks, you go to the Royal Park maybe to look at nature, but you don't think about of the pigeon in the street that you passed on your way to the park as nature. Um, but a spider in the bath or a fox in the bin or a starling in the kitchen, as I had when I was writing this dissertation, um, breaks that barrier and kind of highlights how arbitrary it is. And I think that can make us uncomfortable because um, they remind us a bit too much of ourselves. Um, these urban invasive animals that um, kind of take over and we think, oh, they're going to take over and they're going to get rid of the good nature. And um, and they kind of remind, remind us of all our bad qualities and maybe none of our good. Um, but by transgressing our kind of neat boundaries, they bring that kind of pure, beautiful ideal of nature out over there into the kind of scruffy and dirty reality of everybody's day to day lives. And we kind of need to face that problem head on and come to terms with it because and what's important about these deep dives into certain species is their ability to change people's minds about a creature that was maybe previously disliked or dismissed. I have picked a kind of easy one with starlings because they used to have this reputation as the bird table bully, but partly because they're declining so much, people don't even don't get them on the bird feeders anymore. So they they almost lost that um, negative connotation. So I picked one that was only slightly ignored rather than something that's really hated. But if you can change somebody's mind about a rat or a spider or a seagull, um, that can have quite a profound effect on someone's mentality and caring about an unwanted species, as I hope I've kind of effectively argued, can be as important as saving a rare or a beautiful one. Um, but then the line of this is always um, love them from a distance. Oh, but speaking from the Royal Parks, we've always got to say don't don't feed them from the don't sort of try and get in and up close and <laughs> feed them. Please don't feed birds in the Royal Parks because it's causing them massive behavioural change and making them all very unhealthy and very stressed out. Um, so go out, find your lovely species, learn all about it, love it from a distance. <laughs> um, um, but as Famous biologist Stephen Jay Gould once famously pointed out, um, we will not fight to save what we do not love. So find a species, love it, get other people to love it too, and maybe we'll sort out this mess. <laughs> and that's my talk done. Thank you for hanging on through all of that. Oh, Rachel, amazing. Thank you. Do feel free to share your applause using the uh, whatever this little bar is at the top um, and please do feel free to share in the chat as well and ask any questions you might like you're getting lots of applause and lots of reactions which is exciting um Trudy you've got a question let's hang let me see if I can find you David's got a question as well I think oh Tracy so pop them in the chat if you want guys or if you like let me know in the chat and I'm happy to unmute you and you can ask your question if you'd prefer so either pop it in the chat or let me know in the chat if you want me to try and unmute you um meanwhile while that's happening rachel we had a few questions before like when people registered and yep. a lot of them actually linked to brighton and brighton right. pier yeah um so are the birds i've seen sweeping together over at brighton old west pier starlings yep. uh I assume <laughs> based okay? on your yeah. chat yeah um, although um, but what um, makes it so popular with starlings every year so the west pier is less popular than it used to be mm. um so it used to be the murmuration there was a flock of them that lived under the um well I guess the east pier but the main Brighton pier the one that isn't burnt down for those who don't know Brighton it has an old pier that burnt down and has been slowly breaking off and disappearing into the sea um which is called the west pier and it has an active pier which is called Brighton pier um, and it used to be that there was um, a roosting site in both and the murmuration across Brighton was both roosts murmurating together and then splitting off back down into the two separate piers, um, which is really spectacular. 
they don't roost as much. There's far, far fewer roosting in the West Pier now because another massive chunk of it fell into the sea, um, which meant it stopped being quite so nice a place to roost. But up before that point, um, I think they quite like roosting over water, like they're roosting reed beds and things as well, because I think it's just quite safe from predators. Um, and it just was a lovely, completely cut off from humans, lots and lots of nice perches where they could all huddle in together, place to roost. And they do still roost under the under Brighton Pier. And what's really special about the Brighton murmuration is if you are on the pier, they are murmurating around you. So you're right in the middle of the flock and you can really hear all of their wings going. Um, although it is also set to cheesy pop music because you're on the pier, so, <laughs> which, which I quite like that. Um, <laughs> that's a contrast but might not be everyone's cup of tea they're flying to like rihanna yeah. or whatever <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> um and it is it just that they would live there anyway like yeah one of so the questions was there. where where do they come from but they're yeah, just so they they communally local. they communally roost in winter um so it'll be a mixture of just the local birds from the area and any that have come in from scandinavia um in sp spring and summer they pair off and they nest and they have their nesting territories and they don't do these big communal roosts and they don't do the murmuration so you don't you only see the murmuration in autumn and winter um but uh yeah that's where that's where they've all come from they're roost they, they're sleeping on the pier they sp spread out during the day and go and forage for whatever food they want and they all come back in the evening and sleep in the same place and do the murmuration before they go down to sleep that's cool i think you've answered it but we've had quite a few questions saying when and where are you most likely to see a murmuration yeah, so, so just before sunset yeah just before sunset autumn and winter they don't do it every single night either I'm afraid so um uh I can't promise that if you go down to Brighton that you'll definitely definitely see it and actually embarrassingly because I did my undergrad in Brighton but not my master's um I never saw it my, the whole time I was living in Brighton during my undergrad I didn't even know it was a thing um, and I was just visiting while doing my master's and I just happened to be on the beach at the right time um on the right day and there was an amazing murmuration and that was it I was like right I'm writing about this yeah. <laughs> I must admit I've been to Brighton a lot and I've never really seen it so yeah. I'm like what you have um, to I've seen a, I've seen it on Instagram quite recently a couple of my friends yeah. have been down and been putting it up so um I think they are doing it but it's the conditions I think if it's like a really windy day or a really rainy day then they don't bother yeah so, that was another question we had as well yeah. as are they less likely to murmurate in wet weather so yeah are they quite fair fair weather creatures yeah <laughs> like bats my my beloved mm -hmm. my bats mm -hmm. um so we've seen an increase in small starling flocks to our bird feeders. What food should we provide to encourage more of them? Any um, ideas? They like mealworms. Um, I'm not a super expert on this because I've only had a garden with a bird feeder for like not very long. <laughs> so I'm still learning. Um, I think they would. But given that they, I mean, yeah, birds of kind of starlingy type um, like mealworms. But they will come for most stuff, to be honest. Um, everything like suet pellets. Um, she there's a blog I read who where she always writes about what she's been putting on her feeder and what everything likes. And so the uh, starling fledglings that she, she gets a load of um, newly fledged starlings in her garden every sort of late summer, and that they eat all of her suet pellets. So mealworms and suet pellets would be my <laughs> recommendation. Mary has just said uh, in the chat. <laughs> Uh, starlings demolished 12 fat balls in less than a day oh, how many wow. have you got mary yeah. a whole murmuration <laughs> yeah <laughs> so this is this is why people that's why like they're not in brighton this. anymore they're in mary's <laughs> garden yeah um really interesting here we were at this moment seeing them vying for the best positions on the community tv mast above our apartment in valencia which oh, is wow. awesome international people hello mm -hmm. um how do the murmurations differ between different countries big question i know rachel so don't want worry if you well, don't know. yeah I don't but. think they differ that much they do the same thing in different countries so there's some really f uh, I know they do it in Rome I think I, I haven't looked up my, my knowledge of starlings in different countries is now going back to 2014 and I haven't updated it since so if something drastic has changed since 2014 I'm sorry but in 2014 there was big commemorations in Rome there was big commemorations in Israel uh, were two of the kind of uh, really well-known huge murmurations that you could just see in a city centre um, in um, Jerusalem um, but as far as I know it, it doesn't particularly differ it's the same concept wherever you go same bird they are flocking they are roosting somewhere and they're um, they're doing their big swoopy dance before they all go into roost together basically 
Fair enough. Thank you. And one of the questions we also had was you talked about how they make little mistakes. Um, mm. Somebody's asked for a bit more info on that. Like what kind of mistakes are they making? Is it just that one just suddenly goes the wrong way, like wrong direction? Yeah, slightly. Ways? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it get, it's getting slightly into um, particle physics. So I like read one paper and was like, I think I understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so like slight. So if one bird very slightly um, goes in not even like completely the wrong direction like goes in a tiny bit of the wrong direction the one next to it will also go in the wrong direction and then the one next to that will go even more and the one next to that will go even more until the whole thing's kind of spun around like that um, there's a modeling software that is used for modeling any kind of like big group of things moving together like schools of fish and like yeah. crowds of humans which is specifically called starling i think um oh, cool. because they based it off memorization so i think a lot of the um, it's an open source paper that I read about why they do it that was on a journal called PLOS One. Um, I can't remember. Actually, eh, I've got the dissertation right here in case I've got a question that I didn't know the answer to. But I'm, if I can really quickly see in the bibliography, I can tell you the name of the paper. But yeah. I can answer another question while I'm checking. It's crazy, want. isn't it? Because it's like, um, it's almost just like they've just, it's just taking them ages to get. <laughs> yeah. To, to get to a place it's like oh yeah. Dave you're taking us the wrong way again come on <laughs> um do the American species do memorations as well yeah so the ones in America are the same species they are yeah. the European starling it's just we chucked a load of them over there um as far as I know yes they do also memorate um I haven't massively looked into where or anything like that but same birds does the same thing yeah uh, and African ones as well it's the lilac breast oh, roller the... uh, the starling. coloured ones, I don't know. I don't know if the coloured ones do. Um, if those ones that I showed on um, the, yeah. that first slide, I don't know if they memorate. I just sort of got them because they look pretty. <laughs> I don't know very much about those. You can look it up. <laughs> you can tell me. <laughs> and the similar question is that do you, are there other birds who who murmurate? Like um, it, not like this. Much. Not really like this. Um, like I said, so there are other birds that all gather together in one place and then all fly into the roost all together. So rooks are the are the big one. Um, there's a book by Mark Cocker called Crow Country that's all about that. Um, but they don't do this swooping thing that the starlings do. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, some people call it a memoration if you just have a really, really, really big flock of birds flying somewhere. Yeah. Um, but the specifically really memoration is when they do this thing where they're just making patterns in the sky for about half an hour just all together in a big flock like this um and i don't think anything else does that other than starlings um thank I know you i just saw another question and now it's got oh so you talked a little bit about some of the issues they face um and there's a question in the chat about artificial lighting does artificial light in towns have any effect on them gathering Oh, I think another question has just come in and now I've lost where it was. So do we think, oh yeah, especially now we have white LED street lights and we've talked about whether or not they gather in poor weather. So yeah, do we think like light pollution is an issue for them? Hello, Rachel. Oh, I don't know if Rachel's frozen. Can you hear me? Can people hear me still? Or have I frozen? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think Rachel may have frozen, which is a bit of a shame. Um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Glad you can all still hear me. Oh, she's back. Are you back? Oh, there, there we are. go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that was my was... internet. <laughs> um, yeah, did you hear the question? Do do you rec do we reckon artificial light and light pollution has an impact on, on starlings gathering? Starlings. Um, I don't know. So they have always done it in cities. Uh, like until relatively recently, like they didn't stop when we brought in artificial light. They stopped more basically when we started to use a lot more pesticides and things like that. Um, so I don't know is the answer to that one. Um, they like so, so the memorations have happened in very lit up places. I mean, Brighton Pier is pretty bright um, and it might have an effect on the birds generally. Um, but actually, when they do it is kind of just before or during sunset which is almost that point where the sky's gone a bit dark and the streetlights haven't come, up, come on yet so I don't know if that there's something there but the main answer is I don't know I've also found the name of that paper I was talking yeah, about fabulous. which is oh now I've lost it again 
and uh, some causes of the variable shapes of flocks of birds um, in a plus one volume six issue eight but if you googled some causes of the variable shape of flocks of birds in quotations i'm sure you get it it was just online for anyone to read fantastic thank you rachel um martin and david you've got your hands up uh, let me know in the chat if, I, if we've answered your questions. Um, but other than that, um, I think we'll leave it there if that's all right with everyone. We are almost bang on time, which is very nice. So thank you very much, Rachel. Um, yes, um, once it goes up on our YouTube channel, Paul, we'll, um, we'll get a link out to, to you all if you've registered. Um, but if you just look under the Royal Parks YouTube channel, it will be on there at some point soon anyway. Um, in the chat, I've just put a link to um, the talks we're offering throughout the winter are all free. We want them to be accessible to everyone, but we are a charity. So if you would like to make a donation and you've enjoyed this particular presentation, there's a link in the chat to it there. So thank you very much. We've also got a few more winter warmer talks coming up all the way until early March. So there's a link in the chat to those as well. Uh, and also just to our general events page as well for walks and talks that we've got going on as well. So thank you so much, Rachel. Bye. It was amazing. I'm going to give you another little uh, round of applause. I really enjoyed it. I've learned loads. And Spike oh, was a real treat as well. Yes, he, he is was good. so cute. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Happy yeah, New Year again. Thank you again. so much for coming and listening. <laughs> And, and sticking it out well there's nothing to stick out it was really interesting <laughs> so thank you and take care everyone enjoy the rest of your weeks and hopefully we'll see you this time next week when we'll be discussing volunteering in the parks so mm. rachel may make a cameo but otherwise oh, it'll be all about how sh how you can volunteer and get to know her better and and hound her about <laughs> starlings every time you see her so. yep no come and uh, <laughs> hang out in the parks get involved <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.